And this forum today is really important for several reasons. One is we have uh, the, the representatives of really kind of the three main sort of planning professional and advocacy groups uh, that are linked to planning and that really promote planning are here today. Um, and these are very, very important organizations for you as planning students to, to kind of link up with. Uh, first, because they offer great events, great ways to learn about kind of what's happening on the ground uh, in various domains of the planning field. Um, and they are, are also terrific places to meet other planners, to network, uh, to really kind of understand the lay of the land in terms of uh, what's going on in uh, the job market. And as you'll probably hear or maybe have heard numerous times, uh, you don't get really the job you're looking for by sending out resumes. You get the job you're looking for by talking to people, networking with people, really kind of getting a deeper understanding about the kind of planning organizations and who they hire, what they're looking for. And who they hire. So uh, I want to thank our panel for coming today. I think uh, Dr. Mueller is going to um, introduce them. I also want to point out that um, Rachel Temper from Central Texas APA has left these uh, great handouts up there on the table that that really describe all the events and activities that Central Texas APA does uh, to involve and engage students. So. All right. So um, thanks for coming, and thank you especially to our panelists who you know took time out of their workday to show up uh, and talk to us today. Um, so we have representatives here from Central Texas APA, as Michael just mentioned, Rachel Tupper, who is a graduate of the MSCRP and Urban Design Dual Degree Program, and is a certified urban planner and urban designer working at Perkins Will in Austin. Uh, Randall Matsuno, who's an associate urban planner and architectural designer at McCann Adams Studio here in Austin, um, has a degree from Carnegie Mellon. So not one of ours, but we're happy that he came anyway, um, and has a lot of experience here in Austin and is involved in the Urban Land Institute, uh, especially the ULI Young Leaders Group, which he'll tell us more about. Uh, Leah Bojo, who has, uh, is a graduate of our dual degree program of public affairs, and is a senior land use planner, or senior land use and policy manager for the Drenner Group. Uh, and also worked for quite a long time with council, city council as a policy aide to Chris Riley, right? Um, and has been on the board of, of, some, of the Congress for New Urbanism in Austin since 2011 and is the current chair of CNU in Austin. So um, I thought maybe we could start by just having each of you tell us a little bit about your background and the work that you do now. Okay. So you want to start, Rachel? Okay, I'll start. Um, so my background, my undergraduate degree is in graphic design, um, and I went to planning school because I was interested in telling a larger story. Sometimes as a graphic designer, you kind of get siloed into just um, doing like marketing materials, but I realized that there's a, a huge narrative power in planning to... Um, so I went um, here and I studied planning and urban design. Um, and then after graduating, I went and worked with a landscape architecture firm called Design Workshop. And I worked there for about three and a half years and then realized I love working on the private side, but I really want to understand what it was like to work as a city planner. Um, and so I went and worked with one of my favorite clients um, from Design Workshop, which was the city of Cedar Park. Um, and I worked there for a year, um, and, I, and I, I definitely felt like it wasn't a perfect fit for me, but it was a really good experience to understand um, how land development kind of works and what that process looks like. Um, and then I went back, and now I'm at Perkins & Will, which um, is an architecture firm. So I get, I'm kind of seeing all sides of the spectrum, um, which I guess is something I would share with you all that it's, it's okay, at, you know, at first to sort of bounce around. Planning is a really broad profession, um, and for me it's been really helpful to try out a couple of different um, types of places to find the right fit. 
Um, well, thank you for having me. Um, as Liz said, uh, I'm a, not a graduate of UT, Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. I had got my bachelor of Ar Bachelor's of Architecture there. Um, I do not have a master's in planning, but the way that I fell into the profession was um, graduating in late 2006, uh, just before the recession. Um, I did some coursework in urban design as in my last year of architecture school. And then I also was a, assistant, a teacher's assistant for in GIS for the Heinz School of Public Policy. So I have those two links that sort of were skill sets um, that post-graduation uh, post, post um, and not knowing with the recession oncoming, um, I fell into land use planning um, and environmental planning uh, back in my hometown of Honolulu, Hawaii, uh, a firm called PBR Hawaii. Um, and then when the recession hit, we saw a decline in um, and layoffs in architectural jobs and construction. But what was at, what I viewed as um, sort of uh, kept me afloat was the fact that when folks are not building, they're they're planning to build and waiting for that um, for, for you know to rise out of that and for construction to to resume. Um, from there, like I said, I, I did um, land use planning and environmental planning. Uh, there's a lot of interesting things that you can, uh, that don't necessarily uh, translate to um, the mainland, such as lava hazard zones and, um, you know, a hurricane. And, and, but, there, but there are some that also, um, you know, we are seeing uh, in terms of flooding and um, Flooding locally, it, as it relates to uh, climate change in, in Hawaii, there's a sea level rise. And so there's a lot of those issues that um, we were tackling. Um, in terms of the physical planning aspect of it, back in the day, uh, we were also dealing with, similar to Austin, um, the uh, construction of mass transit. So they're building ele elevated rail at the moment, looking for a lot of designers to work on TODs and stuff like that. But um, my background after the recession had ended um, allowed me to, uh, and it, it's the common thread is ULI, is I've lived in other cities, uh, Honolulu, uh, Philadelphia, Hong Kong, uh, Mel most recently Melbourne, Australia, and now Austin. So one of the ties actually as I've moved around the different cities is that ULI is a global organization. Um, and so I've been involved in every one of those cities uh, with ULI and been able to um, interact with the folks uh, who are, you know, so in some cases dealing with the same issues as Austin and in other cases, uh, you know, are very um, niche to that, that market. Um, been in Austin four years now and with McCann Adams Studio um, working on a lot of uh, interesting stuff. Um, so my role at the moment um, is working with Catellus at uh, Miller um, off of Airport Boulevard, that community. Um, it's a public-private partnership, and um, uh, yeah, so that's me. Um, so I, um, like Dr. Mueller said, um, I was a dual degree program student with um, the LBJ School of Public Affairs and Community Regional Planning here in the Architecture School. Um, I'll, I'll start off by saying that when I first applied to graduate school, I just applied to the LBJ School, and I was thinking I was going to go into nonprofit management because that's what I've been doing up until that point. Um, and it was actually between applying for school and getting into school that I joined my neighborhood contact team. Uh, I was living in the East Cesar Chavez neighborhood at that time and kind of like learned what land use was and learned what planning was and zoning. And, and that was a really, um, I mean, it, that neighborhood in particular has been going through a lot of change. It was a really intense, it still is a really intense time for those folks. And so all of a sudden I, I kind of had my eyes open to how important planning and, and land use is to everyone's kind of everyday lives. So I, I added the planning degree on and like kind of never looked back <laughs> and um, did the two programs together, um, which was really which was really great and um, got to kind of have both the policy and the planning together, um, which led me to the first job I got, which actually wasn't quite finished with my degrees yet, but I got an internship and then ended up rolling into a permanent position in a council member office. Um, which was a pretty um, intense and also really um, kind of well-rounded, kind of like what Rachel was saying, like well-rounded way to find out about how land use really works and like kind of what policy intentions are and why sometimes um, 
sometimes seemingly um, ineffective regulations that were put in place in the first place, <laughs> you know, and understanding really like how, what it's like to first of all work for a representative of constituents and then also to understand what it's like to be trying to kind of, um, you know, kind of corral and guide the growth in a place like Austin where there's so much going on. Um, so I did graduate from those in spite of working, <laughs> and uh, and I was I left the public sector and went to the private sector at the time that um, Austin went from at large districts to single member districts. I don't know how many of y'all were around at that time. It was a major change. It was a charter amendment, um, and it was kind of an opportunity to um, to make a change for me. So I started working um, on the private side for entitlement firms. Um, first for a planning firm, and now I work for a law firm. Um, doing uh, kind of like land use consulting stuff like we help people with all kinds of aspects of their projects whether it's changing their zoning kind of there's a lot of stuff in Austin that needs to kind of be cleaned up like there's our code is so weird and there's so many weird little band-aids all over the place that often just to get a project built there's some work that has to be done uh, and then also kind of helping um, property owners and developers figure out like what makes the most sense like if they have a piece of land that they're looking at like what should it be should it be housing should it be office like what you know what makes sense for them and what can they do. Um, so it's been a lot, uh, it's really, I mean, Austin's an amazing place to work um, because there's so much going on here. Um, but I would also, um, again, speaking to Rachel's point, like if you have the opportunity to work in a few different, kind of a few different angles on things, I think it can really be enlightening. I think part of the reason that I can be successful from my position now is because I have been on the inside of that work. I have been in a policymaker office and so I often will, can say like, I, I understand what the goal is that we're trying to reach. Um, I don't think it's gonna work that well if we do it this way, but I think we could get there if we do it this way, for example, and kind of having that, um, all of those perspectives um, is a great way. And you can get those, not only, you don't have to work for a you know, council member to do that, you can get that by just getting involved with city stuff, or, you know, boards and commissions, or even just um, advocacy and working with the city on, on a lot of the policy changes, because there's so much, there's so much happening right now. Okay, so that's a um, great background for, the, for what we want to talk about today. Um, so what I want to ask each of you to talk about now is to talk about the organization that you're involved with, how you came to be involved in it, um, what your role is now, and, and what benefit, you know, how you see it being helpful to you in your career. So, you want to start, Rachel? I'll start. So, um, I'm representing the American Planning Association, um, which how many of you are members of APA? Yeah, okay, so it seems like um, more than half of you, um, so I won't go into too much detail about the national APA, um, but basically, you know, APA is kind of a nested organization, so you've got national, and then you've got state chapters, and then you've got regional sections. And so I am the secretary for our regional section, which is the central section, um, and it represents, there's actually super plenary, there's like maps of the counties that each um, region represents. And our county goes actually as far southeast as Victoria. Um, so it's, it's an interesting um, kind of geographic um, boundary that for a long time we've sort of wondered, you know, do we consolidate and get closer in or do we... Um, continue to represent such a large uh, boundary and um, we've stayed with representing a large boundary because what it does do is having College Station and UT within the same um, within the same kind of region is is has helped with synergy so we can actually do events that um, bring you know both universities together um, so that's so, a so APA Central Texas for me has been a great way to get involved with local uh, planning work um, and also in events. Um, but a I would say APA nationally has been really helpful. Um, you know, I'm AICP certified and that was not only a really good test, like I always like to plug that I think it's a good way to understand all the different um, kind of like areas of planning. Um, so I don't, I'm an urban designer, so I don't really do like the NEPA process, but I had to, I had to learn a lot about it for the, for this test. So um, I recommend doing that as early as possible. Um, and then also the conferences are, the, both the state and the national conferences are just really great ways to meet other planners and 
So for me, I've, I've actually gotten to stay in touch with um, my friends from planning school through being involved with both the, and going to the Texas and the national um, conferences. And the last thing I'll say is that whether you go into private sector or public sector, or maybe you do like me and you bounce around a bit, um, doing uh, both speaking at and going to conference sessions is really helpful. I've spoken at three conference sessions at the Texas chapter, um, and just preparing for that and you know having that on, on my resume, but also I just think that, that that's built character, kind of um, coming up with a theme for a session and getting to ask people like either clients or people that I respect, other planners, to lead a session with me has, has connected me really intimately with them on you know, working together on a project, um, like, like doing a session. So that, for me, has been a really good experience. So. Um, well, the Urban Lands Institute is, um, as I mentioned before, it is a global organization. Um, they have their foundation um, under the idea, or under the focus of real estate and development, but um, the sort of membership body is much more than that. Um, it is a diverse group of folks who are there to meet, learn, and network. Um, they include developers, they include the policymakers, city officials, uh, planners, architects, civil engineers, you have brokers, you have the financial folks. Um, so. It's, uh, there's no certification involved in it, as maybe CNU or APA might have, but um, what it does and who you're in the room with are those that um, sort of are making the decisions of uh, where, where money goes, where investment goes, the policies, and um, those who like make cities and the world function and are, are building, um, you know, Plaza Saltillo, um, I-35 infrastructure projects, um, or are investing in um, philanthropic stuff such as uh, Shoal Creek or Waller Creek um, uh, agencies. Um, I that's specifically why I um, got involved is my curiosity on uh, beyond the architecture realm and in, in understanding and having to work as as a planner having to work with. Um, civil engineers, the officials, the understanding what the needs of the developer are, how to get all of this through the um, permitting process. Um, you will meet the people who uh, are somehow in touch with those decisions and know the process, um, and that's where you'll learn um, if you ask, if you're uh, eager enough to ask the right questions. Um, ULI, um, the Austin chapter, I mean, Urban Land Institute is a bit deceiving because it uh, involves surrounding areas, the domain, um, Cedar Park, and such. Uh, anywhere where development is occurring, it's sort of inclusive of that. Um, I'm, my role is involved um, in a subset called the Young Leaders Committee. Um, it's a group of uh, sort of volunteers uh, within, who have already been within the organization for a while. We recruit them to sort of develop programs that are specifically geared towards uh, the questions that our, our under 35 uh, population uh, are asking and want to know about. Um, we we uh, try to hold events about um, eight to ten events a year, um, whether that be, uh, I guess, um, uh, development tours such as Paso Saltillo, um, or most recently we did a, um, a tour of foundation communities. Um, you know, there's a we try to s the, uh, we'll have monthly breakfasts that are all encompassing for all of the members. Uh, that happens downtown where where a panel will try and tackle a pressing issue or topic uh, such as transportation is always one. Uh, affordability is another one that's rising. Um, and so the young leaders will sometimes either be, uh, will either provide inspiration for those topics, such as last year, I think there was, a, we had a couple folks from the city of Austin talk about resiliency. Uh, resiliency in our cities, both uh, like, uh, from an affordability standpoint, from an environmental standpoint. Um, and then that was taken up to um, a larger panel. Uh, we also can cover topics that maybe are, uh, 
sort of uh, more more sort of focused um, specifically, and um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, I think one of the best ways to just um, see what we have to offer is to get involved and, and check out the website. <coughs> Um, so I'm here with Congress for New Urbanism, the Central Texas chapter, um, which is also a, a chapter of a larger national organization. Um, the national organization has a conference every year. This year it's in Louisville in mid-June, um, which is awesome. If you can get there, it's totally like, it's the time once a year when all these like amazing folks from across the whole country come into one town, and they always pick a town with some kind of sort of urban question or urban um, like urban design aspect of it that's interesting. Like um, we had it in Salt Lake City one year because they have these really long block lengths. Like we had it in Savannah last year because they have all these squares. Like there's always sort of some kind of focus on it. Um, but it's a really fun, really fun conference and it's a really great way to meet some heavy hitters from around the country that come in and, and come to the conference. Um, locally, we try to have events um, I would say we try to have an event every month or two. Uh, I think the next one we have coming up, we're actually co-sponsoring with APA <laughs> in March. Um, but we have everything from like panel discussions where if there's someone in town, um, you know, we'll try to get them to come and do like a smaller conversation or we'll have happy hours, often networking with other organizations with, that are kind of like-minded or, um, you know, have some overlap. Um, something that I think is really cool about CNU here in Central Texas is that it's a real mix of people. Um, similar, it sounds like, to ULI. It's, um, it's architects, engineers, policy folks. Um, it's a really diverse group of people, and so it's really fun to um, to have even like <laughs> like I think our happy hours are one of our more popular events because it's so much fun to like it's just a bunch of like people nerding out about whatever the current <laughs> question is in Austin, you know, over a beer and a snack, and it's like it's a really great way to meet people, and in particularly if you're thinking about jobs. It's a great way to both learn about kind of all the things that people are doing out there in the planning world and like what that's like, um, and also a great way if you're, you know, wanting to get to know someone at an organization, like there, you know, if you can find out if there, you know, someone's on our board or if it's some of our more active folks, like they, you know, they might be at those events. Um, so I would definitely encourage you to do that. You can sign up for our newsletter on the Central Texas, CNU Central Texas website. You don't have to be a member um, to sign up and then you get notices about all the stuff that's going on. Um, the big event we have every year is we have a big annual luncheon. We just had it in December. Um, we had um, a great turnout. Uh, we had Doug Farr as our speaker, who was um, one of the lead consultants on the Colony Park um, master plan. Um, so yeah, so I would definitely encourage you to come out, CNU. Um, I've been involved for a really long time. I'm actually, this is my last year I'm terming out of CNU, and I feel like <laughs> it's like a little part of me. It's, it's like a it's a major chapter to end because CNU has been such a cool, such a cool um, way to kind of glue everything together. Um, the mission of CNU is really about building it's building places people love, and so it's about like the human aspect of the development that we're seeing. Um, it's about making sure that you know whether it's the public realm between two private you know developments or whether it's some other kind of public space, um, whether you know it's about making sure that that place is designed for people you know like the aspect of the person walking down the street or entering into the plaza or whatever. Um, and so that's informed my work a lot and it's informed the way that I consult with my clients um, about making sure that they're thinking about that and, and realizing that and understanding also why we have certain requirements, say, in our urban design guidelines or in our, you know, our city code and what that's intended to do and how we can really make sure that their projects meet those goals. So, um Maybe you each could talk a little about ways students could get involved or ways that you would like maybe CRP to partner with you more to help students be more involved. Okay, so I did, as Michael mentioned, I did leave a little fact sheet for you guys. Just as I was writing the notes for coming to speak today, I realized it'd probably just be easier to write it all down and kind of put our logo on it and give it to you guys so that you'll remember. Um, so pardon me while I kind of read the, the highlights. We're actually doing a lot, um, which is, I think, a little bit new for APA Central Texas. We've sort of been a bit dormant, but we're trying to really change that. We've got active board members that are really trying to see a lot happen. So um, 
like Leah said, we have we also have a newsletter, um, and you don't have to be a member, though it sounds like a lot of you are, which is great. Um, so if you are a member, you should already get our newsletter. Um, but if not, you can go to our website and you can um, sign up for it. Um, we also have committees, so if you are interested in joining a committee, we've got quite a few going on right now. Um, we have an awards committee, so every year the Central Texas se section gives out planning awards. Um, and so if you'd like to be on that committee, you could serve on that in that capacity. Um, if you really like event planning, there's a couple event planning committees, um, such as the Community Service Planning Committee and the Awards Banquet. So the, we kind of have two committees for awards. One is helping select the, um, the winners, and then the other one is planning the, the big banquet that we do every year. Um, and then the last thing is an initiative that's kind of um, a project of, uh, that I started um, because my um, colleagues and friends were saying, you know, I want to get involved with APA, but I don't want to plan events. Like, I plan events so, so often for my own job. Or, um, and so the idea of a policy committee came up as a way for, people, for planners to get involved. Um, and that was also because the big... Um, Obviously, we, we, in Austin, if you've been in Austin for a while, you've followed um, the Code Next process and that um, planners were kind of silent on that, or at least it wasn't as present as maybe the architecture community and, and some of the other. Um, and, and so it, the idea was, you know, maybe, pl maybe planners, though nationally APA gets very involved with policy issues, and even at the Texas level, there's policy initiatives, but how does that trickle down to the local level, and how can planners be out there sharing um, our values and our agenda with um, local leaders? So the policy committee is new, um, but if you are interested in getting involved with that, um, that's that's something you can do. And then um, the other new thing that we have is a scholarship. Um, so. We have a scholarship program now that's starting. Um, the It'll start April 1st with a deadline of April 29th, and then we'll announce the, the um, recipients um, at our awards banquet, which will be in May, but we haven't selected the exact date of that. Um, and so we're doing a, it's a $500 scholarship to each university. So there'll be one you know, UT recipient, one Texas State recipient, and one A&M recipient. Um, so you should definitely, if you're interested in that, um, you should uh, get the newsletter or follow up with us or subscribe so that you can follow that process. Um, and then if you're interested in elections, we in serving on the board, um, there's a little bit of info on that. I won't go into it right now. But the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, the AICP candidate program. So this is, this is a new thing nationally that... Um, so you don't have to wait. Uh, the, the, the process used to be that you had to get professional planning experience before you could take the AICP exam. But, na but now with the candidate program, you could actually take the exam first. And so that allows you to essentially, you know, you could be AICP candidate certified right away, right after you graduate, and then once you've worked your experience, which I believe is, is two years, so don't quote me, definitely check the website. Um, but then you're, you know, you're already AICP certified. In, and you don't, and the other thing is, you don't have to study a lot of the things that you're learning right now, again, in two or three years. You can just do it right, right when you graduate. So definitely want to plug that. Um, and like I said, there's a couple other things I didn't mention, but um, take a fact sheet on your way out. All right. Well, um, for those not familiar with um, ULI, uh, I think the biggest way to get involved while still as a student, there is the uh, ULI Heinz competition that is a multidisciplinary uh, team. Uh, I believe UT is pretty strong and has submitted uh, and actually been finalists in several of the past years. Um, it, and right now? Yeah, and right now. Yeah, you have two of the four teams. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really... Uh, it gives you a little taste in, in the, of the real world and working with folks from the real estate or also from the finance and, and also uh, architecture school into how does, um, how does urban development or even um, whatever, how do you solve the problem and then how do you make it prosper. 
um, and allows you to work collaboratively as you would in the a real world. And also, I mean, challenge you because you know dynamics between teams uh, can be pluses, there can be minuses, but um, you know it pr presents itself in a real world scenario. Um, beyond the ULI Heinz competition, I would say uh, ULI they do offer a student discount for while you're still. Uh, in your graduate course, master's courses, um, but for ULI, you don't need to necessarily be a member to attend our events. Um, we also we have a non-member event rate if you just want to come to a breakfast and on a topic that you think is uh, intriguing and hear from the panelists. Uh, we also offer um, a cheers and chat uh, for new members to sort of uh, ask the questions that they have specifically about the organization, meet someone. Uh, who's been involved for a couple of years. Um, while I'm here representing the Young Leaders Committee, um, there are a couple other uh, sort of uh, initiatives that I would like to mention. So the Young Leader Committee is for uh, those uh, professionals that are under the age of 35, just sort of out of um, their degree and sort of looking to get exposure to the industry. Uh, following that, there's a new one called ULI Next, which is those who are beyond the basics of planning and development in real estate and are looking to, to continue um, sort of a group dynamic and, and sort of career mid-career focused initiatives. So those over 35, between 35 and 45, who maybe aren't exactly the CEOs of companies or founded their own firm, but are still looking to challenge themselves and um, in, a, in a sort of structured manner for programs and stuff like that. Um, the real estate uh, ULI breakfast can be um, daunting specifically for um, females because, but ULI has developed an initiative, the Women Leadership Initiative, which is specifically geared towards uh, women in real estate where they will have breakfast that in, a, in an environment that you, you can feel more comfortable um, sort of with your your uh, peers uh, around, and um, that's been something that's really been pushed forward. Um, and in the same way that uh, when the leadership initiative is, uh, you can ask the questions, maybe you don't feel as comfortable at the bigger breakfast, the Young Leaders also serves as, um, serves that in the form of our mentorship forum. So once a year, um, uh, folks in the Young Leaders Committee can submit their application for the mentorship form. What that is, is um, a structured uh, program where applicants are divvied into groups, uh, multidisciplinary groups, with uh, one industry leader. It's been um, city officials in the past, it's been those on the lost legal side, uh, physical planners, developers, uh, those in finance, but it allows you an intimate setting of between eight and 12 people of your peers and one leader to um, sort of guide yourself in, in, in learning more about the industry and um, what you specifically as a group want to know more about, whether it's Code Next, whether it's affordability, whether it's um, floodplain issues, but you have a year of, you meet once a month and you have, you cover a different topic that is um, organized within your group. So uh, that's one of our more popular um, events. So you can transition from student into young leaders or one of the other programs and um, to your liking, really. Um, so CNU, um, I kind of mentioned the events. I think that's really a great way to get, um, get introduced to the organization and then the folks that are really involved. Um, that would be my that would be my suggested starting point. Um, we also have a policy committee as well that um, usually meets about once a month. Um, we have we try to keep that policy committee to have kind of a connection to city hall. Um, we try to have a council aide on that committee so that we can kind of keep track of what's going on at city hall and weigh in. Um, the role of that committee is really to like weigh in and kind of guide the board on how to weigh in on particular policy initiatives that are coming forward so it's a really fun way to keep track of what's going on at the city um, we have a local board of course um, and the board also has alternates so another great way to get involved is if you know anyone on the board or if you get involved with like the policy committee for example or there's also an education and outreach committee um, 
kind of getting to know how the organization works and then serving as a board alternate um, is a way to kind of like start making steps toward um, you know being a board member and, and being more involved with the, guiding the organization um, you know or just um, you know, even just reading, like, if you subscribe to the newsletter, you know, you can subscribe to the local newsletter. There's also a national newsletter, which is a great way to just keep track of how CNU, what CNU National is working on. It's kind of amazing how many issues we're dealing with here in Austin that, like, a lot of other cities are dealing with and a lot of other cities are trying to figure out and having a hard time figuring out and trying things. And, you know, um, it gives you a real feel for sort of where where all of us are, all of the cities are, as far as dealing with a lot of the things you mentioned, like affordability and transportation and transit and all that. Um, Code Next is going to be a big one when our city manager comes back with a plan and a strategy. <laughs> I think CNU was very involved in the last um, the last round of input, and I would expect that, that the organization will again be really involved in, in weighing in. And um, we have a charter. Um, you can find on the website that um, really lays out our kind of our principles and so um, what we try to do whenever we weigh in on any issue and in particular with Code Next is really um, describe why our, you know, kind of relay our input as it relates to the charter and the charter is really about a lot about people and place making and um, making places people love. Okay, so I'm going to ask one more question then I'm going to let people in the audience ask questions. And that what I wanted to ask now kind of relates to what you were just saying, Leah. What do you see um, kind of moving forward as a likely focus for your organization in Austin, like issues you want to work on? And maybe it's code next. I, I heard that the city manager did give a little preview at the council work session this week and is apparently going to tell the council who needs them to make policy decisions on a number of topics that have been sticking points moving forward, but if, if you could talk a little bit about substantively where you see your organization being focused in sure. your future. Maybe yeah, I'll start this end. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Code Next will be a big one, um, for sure. Uh, I think due to who is involved with CNU, like I said, arch kind of architects and engineers and, and um, traffic engineers and landscape architects and different folks, um, we have a I think a pretty well-rounded uh, idea of what we see our code, what, what we see as the downfalls of our code. So everyone is pretty excited about weighing in on where we really think that we should be fixing things, frankly. Um, and then another big one that we're working on right now is the Austin Str Strategic Mobility Plan. Um, we've been following that very closely and they just released a draft and um, um, we've got a group of folks that's working on making suggestions. You know, a lot of you know, when the city releases these plans, they usually have a public input process. I mean, they should have a public input process that's formal. It's just that sometimes it's really hard to navigate that. It's really hard to figure out how to plug in. You're just one person. You can't read this, like, hundreds of page long document. And, you know, so being involved with a group helps a lot, just even participating through the processes that are really available to everyone but are kind of um, a little tough to get through. Um, another kind of detailed thing, but I think it, it kind of gives you an idea of the kind of stuff we dig into, that... CNU has weighed in on for a while now is um, there were some changes proposed to um, the fire criteria manual, I think is what it's called, which related to street width. So the fire department, um, um, not surprisingly, with a single focus of <laughs> when there is a fire driving their giant truck, you know, the biggest fire you could ever imagine, like what they need to drive their truck down, um, was wanting to um, expand and expand the width of streets and reduce the number of people who have the authority to <laughs> weigh in on that and to only them. Uh, <laughs> and so what they were doing, what, what that effect would have been, is basically making like all the new streets all across the city wider and wider um, for this. Not that fire safety is important, of course, but you know, um, if you design your city around these worst case scenarios, you're going to end up with a kind of a crummy city for the rest of the time <laughs> when we're all walking and biking and, yeah, and moving around. And so we really went deep on that one and um, and had, you know, met with a bunch of folks. Our fire chief turned over during that time, which made it a little um, difficult, but it's an ongoing conversation. And those are the kinds of things that come up. Someone saw it on an agenda and was like, wait a minute, what's happening here? Dug into it. And it turned out it was a really, like, very consequential very seemingly small policy decision that was sitting on a council agenda that we kind of like have burrowed in on and really, um, you know, I think the folks that have been working on it have really had a, big, a major effect. So this isn't related to you a lot, but piggybacking off of that, I mean, one of the, one, I think one of the issues that and consequences of 
um, the fire lane widening is that they're, and it's like from my own personal perspective, is that they're being close-minded and and a sort of operating under their current practices. And we, uh, for a lot of folks who have traveled, there are uh, opportunities to for smaller vehicles or more efficiencies. They're sort of designing under worst case scenario, and then also with these large 40, 45 footer uh, large turning radius trucks, which are widening our streets, putting putting red marks all over the all over the curbs. Uh, and at Miller specifically, sort of changing the dynamic of uh, where parking goes. Um, and so, yeah, that is, uh, uh, you know, it's one of those, those yeah. issues. So, I mean, I think that sort of chipping away at the mindset of, of them and their sort of approach is, is definitely something rather than just not approving something. But um, for ULIs, um, I think, given that it is real estate focused, um, it's one of, and it's been the issue um, for a couple years now is um, the housing boom and building boom and when are we going to see sort of a drop in that. Um, there's multiple facets of that and consequences of um, that, <coughs> that sort of uh, trickle down from that such as affordability. Um, but Austin, with given the, the numbers and the 100 plus people moving here a day, um, how do we keep up with that? And I think that um, it's it's not a very easy equation. Um, there's there's are the policy issues and the zoning issues that try to address it. There there's no sort of uh, magic wand or one one solution that suits all. Uh, I mean, there's the consequences of transportation, but um, but for ULI, it is when uh, sort of speculating. Um, with market shifts and, and history, history uh, and analysis, when are we going to see sort of uh, the next sort of uh, slowing down? I don't want to say recession or anything like that, but slowing down in building. Uh, I mean, you see the number of cranes outside when you look downtown at the skyline. Um, and so folks are just trying to keep up. Every, everything is trying to keep up. The infrastructure, um, sort of affordability, and, um, you know, uh, office, the amount of office space, and so it's addressing all of those things. Um, I think for for the for APA, one of the things that we one of the reasons we started a policy committee is sometimes it's hard for planners to get involved in activism or in in advocacy, um, only in that there's this feeling that they and, well, and also sometimes there's a there's a requirement that they be, you know, kind of neutral. Um, but we know that everybody has bias, and that there's that 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 there's always, um, you know, planners can serve a really important role in getting involved in their communities, whether it be on their neighborhood um, committees, because they understand a lot of the nuances of um, technical documents and city planning, but also, um, you know. Planners having this AICP, you know, APA has a code of ethics, um, and and in that code of ethics, you know, we state our values, and so falling on our code of ethics is a way that we can advocate, and we can say that you know the planners believe in this, and we think that this is important, and this policy is you know not in line with our values, and so. I think um, sometimes planners tend to sort of start working maybe at a city and not wanting to get involved with with advocacy work um, and because it might conflict with their professional work um, and sort of goes quiet on that. And so um, I think the CNU policy committee is great and I think that it would be great if we can be involved in both, but I think one of the reasons that we started the policy committee for APA was to give public, to give planners the opportunity to really advocate, but advocate within this framework that you know the AICP ethics uh, co committee or um, charter gives us, and so that's um, so that's one of the initiatives. And the other thing is just locally, we're just trying to grow our membership. Um, I mentioned to Liz, I'm also involved with Up Club, which is just a ha it's a happy hour group for urban professionals, which you guys should totally get involved with. Um, APA and CNU are sponsoring um, an event April 14th at um, uh, 
which will, will go out in the newsletter probably for both of us, but um, I think that Up Club kind of formed because APA wasn't doing enough in a way um, to kind of just have events and, um, and really be uh, on the calendar. Um, and so one of the ways that APA is kind of ramping up is just being more present and being involved and so that we don't have, um, so that we can be that organization that really brings um, um, people together. So. Okay, well I'm going to open it up so the audience can ask some questions. Uh, so I'm not currently a student. I'm considering applying to the CRP program at UT. Uh, just kind of trying to soak up as much information as possible. Uh, are, are the events for each of your organizations open to the public, or do you have to be a student? Or? So our, our events are open to everybody, and they're usually free, I think, often free. Um, absolutely. In fact, we're, we have uh, one of our board members right now is Dean Almy, um, and we're trying specifically to get, I mean, to get everyone, students, <laughs> students and others involved, because our organization tends toward more professionals. Um, which is great and is a real resource, but you know we 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 actually are hoping to get more students involved. Um, I think I mentioned before, yeah, ULI um, events. Uh, there is a fee um, for the for the larger breakfasts where um, for the that in, in, encompass the entire chapter. There is a capacity, so we do. It's a bit steeper for non-member non -member fees, I think closer to $75. But uh, for the Young Leaders uh, events, which 10 to 12 a month, <clears throat> usually the membership fee is about $10, and then the non-member fee is about $15. So that just covers our, our cost of providing you with, for those of age, uh, of liquor or, or, or something, you know, a beverage for the afternoon happy hour. So the $75 is that, but that's not for a single event. It, it, is, it, it is. It is. But as a as a member, you, you'll get a, a reduced um, reduced fee. But it's um, yeah. Usually, all of our breakfasts sell out because um, it's at the Headliners Club um, at uh, the Chase Tower downtown. Um, it holds maybe about three hundred people. But the, and there's not a student rate for those. Uh, I think there is a student rate. Um, I'd I'd have to, to check. Yeah, um, online. There, there's it breaks it down in different categories, and you can um, select which one you are, uh, or search if you're a member, search your member. It'll save it, and then uh, it'll apply that rate. Um, there's also the cheers and chats, which is p potentially for people who are um, just sort of new, new or looking to get um, involved or, or sort of roll in to see what what opportunities there are. It's more, very informal. I think we try to, as I said, it's not always downtown. We, if you're for folks living up in Cedar Park, you know, there's development happening all over. We try, we're trying to expand the, the reach and not be always downtown because we know people, planners and, and other folks live in Westlake or work in Westlake, they work in the east side, you know, work up a uh, tech reach area. So we're trying to broaden our scope. Um, for APA, most of our events are free. Um, actually, for students, the membership is free for two years and then, or for um, your time as a student, and then for two years following. So, you should definitely um, take advantage of that. There, occasionally, we'll have like we'll have our awards luncheon, um, which will charge for that just because. Um, but it's usually a really small fee. It doesn't. Um, it's just to kind of help with the cost of the luncheon, but generally our events are free and um, the membership, like I said, is free for students. Well, uh, currently there are two high-speed rail lines proposed for Texas. I'm interested in uh, how much uh, uh, your firm's organizations are either involved directly or looking into those issues. There's a, something very strange and strange anymore happening <laughs> over here, but uh, I have not heard much talking about that in the public sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we, um, CNU was, was paying pretty close attention to the um, not the high speed stuff, but like when Lone Star Rail was, was on the table. <laughs> um, we haven't really waited on the high speed stuff. I mean, we're, it'd be interesting actually, that's a good point. We should probably be, we should be paying closer attention to that because it does seem like that is, there's a growing conversation about. Yeah. 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 Ye
went back to the cook. And with our organization is Central Texas, so we're really Austin. We, we're Austin heavy, and we kind of always have been Austin heavy. At times we've had folks like in San Antonio or in San Marcos kind of sprout up, and when we've had board members down there, we've had a presence in those other places, but then if those folks have to leave the board, um, it's really, you know, as you can imagine, it's hard to keep track of other municipalities. <laughs> but this might be kind of a Central Texas, like a broader Central Texas issue. Well, certainly, yeah. yeah. So this, uh, uh, Dallas, uh, Austin, all the way to Brownfield. All the way to Brownfield. Yeah, this, uh, this one well, actually starts from uh, Norman and Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, goes to this, uh, or in parallel to I-35. But well, I mean, current alignment it comes to the Austin area, it tends to back the Austin oh, really? center. You know. Oh, really? So it tends to you know, very uh, strange uh, arrangement over there. Mm -hmm. Maybe private sector is going really after the potential. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, the, that's uh, there's all the high speed aspect of it. I haven't heard too much. Um, there hasn't been a lot of discussion within ULI, uh, or maybe I just haven't been talking to the appropriate people. But fo the folks from Capital Metro who are doing the local uh, transit, um, ULI has done, and the exact name of it escapes me. But it's like a case study where they've um, they were hired. Technical advisory. Yeah, yeah, the, the TAP, the technical advisory panel, where a bunch of professionals have come in and they've done a, sort of a, an analysis of it and presented a bunch of options um, regarding the, this is specifically the, uh, the downtown rail expansion right at the convention center. Um, it's permitted, it's, it's going to break ground pretty soon. And um, so ULI has, has done those t TAPs. Um, that focus on specific issues and dive a little bit deeper into the details of it to provide um, their, their uh, professional input. Uh, private sector, personally at McCann Adams Studio, uh, we are, we were the designers for the uh, downtown rail station uh, expansion and that's um, sort of, I have a little bit more knowledge about the breaking ground of that, but uh, what that'll do, and it also, it piggybacks off of the tap is it's, closing down a portion of, um, of 4th Street in front of the convention center to vehicles, uh, providing a pedestrian uh, plaza in front of Brush Square, uh, and then also providing an expanded capacity and trackway uh, for the terminus downtown station. Uh, from the planning perspective, there's visions, hopefully, for it to come all the way through, um, all the way through, uh, through 4th Street and connect further south. Um, I also know Capital Metro has their Project uh, Project Connect um, plan that sort of we're sort of um, working with uh, to create maybe potentially a north-south uh, connection um, in certain areas, um, and then it will probably go to um, uh, some sort of bond um, election. Um, and yeah. Uh, I, I appreciate the comment about um, planners' values and the code of ethics. The guys of profession. And I have a related question. Do you feel like, when you think about the course of your career, do you think that there have been any changes to how um, planning organizations perceive the need to understand racial inequity specifically um, as a social dynamic that planners work in? And, um, relatedly, would you encourage um, uh, applicants to the organizations, job applicants, to um, talk about that as an interest or as, a, as an aptitude in understanding the social network? I would say yes, that, that I think um, our organization, or APA, is, has initiatives to try to broaden the field. At the same time, I think it's there's definite deficit there, um, just in terms of I think the representation of you know who is a planner and and also like maybe even who is an APA um, nationally and uh, so I think that like I think that that's something that we're that there are initiatives for, but there's not anything specific in Central Texas that we're doing to kind of. Um, bolster that locally um, and I think we do have um, 
things geared towards young planners, but we don't have any we don't have any programs geared specifically towards uh, like you Elida sort of a women's initiative. We don't have anything for um, you know get for kind of uh, encouraging more people to uh, more diverse voices to be a part of our local chapter. So I think that's something that we could definitely work on. And personally, I think your second question, yes, definitely, that that's something that um, if I take off my APA representation hat, um, that that it's something that you know you should bring up and as a part of your. Um, if, if you're passionate about that, I think that that's something that the planning profession is, is lacking in, and, and so the more we, we're talking about it, the more things we can do about it, the, the better. Um, similar, on, I mean, I guess there is, ULI has, as I said before, uh, focused on being more inclusive to the Women Leadership Initiative. Um, I think as a, as a organization, um, it, it is a global organization and so voices and experts from all around the world can chime in from a, a global perspective in the newsletters on, uh, on issues, but there is nothing specifically um, that I'm aware of that is um, more of a racial inequality um, uh, focus. Um, I would say, um, you know, my, uh, my personal professional development has all really happened here in Austin, and I would say there's been a huge shift in Austin of SARS awareness of those inequalities and awareness specifically of how planning, past pr planning practices and current planning practices are, are affecting those, those conversations. And, um, so I think that, um, and that's just to answer the first part of your question sort of about my professional development. Um, you know, I would say from the perspective of CNU, um, CNU is, is also a part of that conversation and is very aware also of the way that planning practices, both past and sort of current, um, are, are exacerbating a lot of those issues. Um, I think everybody in Austin is realizing, I would say that there's a lot, I wouldn't say realizing, because I think people have realized it for a long time, but I think people are, there's more momentum behind doing something about it. You know, like with so much growth for so long here, I think there's more folks that are really realizing that like, this isn't something that's gonna fix itself. Like we really have to like make active policy decisions to have an effect on that. Um, and there's a lot to do, and I don't think everyone even knows what there is to do, but you know, sort of an acknowledgement that there's a ton to do there. Um, and then as far as you, you know, I think it depends a lot on what job you're talking about going after as far as how you would talk about that related to that job. But um, I don't think, I think any job in Austin, Texas, or probably anywhere, but again, I'll speak to Austin, any job, that's gonna be a relevant part of the story, right? So like if you're applying for a job and you said like, should I talk about that or should I bring up, you know, that that topic, like I think everyone is realizing that like we have to be talking about it with as far as sort of like every policy and planning decision that we're making. Um, on that note, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to slip out. <laughs> Steve, well, Randall, did you mention the uh, Texas uh, um, I, I'm not as, uh, they're, they're, I'm aware of the Texas Forum, I'm not that um, involved in that, but did you want to I'm a member of ULI, yep. and there is a student membership of $135 yes. a year, yep. um, but the Texas Forum is coming up uh, May 8th and 10th, and it takes place in Austin. And so there's going to be tours of yeah. the um, uh, the C home district, the mm -hmm. uh, Miller, yep. and I forget there's a third tour coming up. But I, mm -hmm. I, I went to one in San Antonio two years ago, mm -hmm. and it was it was great. I mean, it's it's, it's really a small group, but uh, there are people who are involved in the uh, real estate development industry. If that's your that's what you're interested in, uh, it's a it's a great place yeah. to network. Yeah, I mean, there. I, I only mentioned a couple of our programs, um, but there are, there is the Texas Forum that goes from city to city. Uh, there is um, uh, ULI Marketplace, which is sort of our once a year big event that for the entire uh, membership body that um, folks are allowed to uh, 
sort of feature their feature their firm, feature their projects, uh, and and sort of just have a good time. Uh, there's also a leadership exchange, which um, is sort of an offshoot of the young leaders, where you can uh, for a weekend go to um, Fort Worth or Dallas or San Antonio or Houston and meet with other ULI members from that chapter and they'll sort of see what, what they're doing and the issues that they are um, tackling within their city. So um, it, there's a lot that ULI uh, ha has to offer. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mention a lot of it today, but I mean, um, it's, you can discover them on the website or ask any questions if you have any. Any questions? Mm -hmm. I'm interested in hearing uh, from you your uh, thoughts on uh, teaching a course offering, uh, well, at the school inside this uh, program, what uh, I'm ending work is uh, it's not about still from uh, your experience. Uh, seems like uh, what courses for a planning and master's degree program, uh, what courses, uh, what kind of methods, skill sets, or uh, other others? Mm -hmm. But uh, they should be covered absolutely uh, in school, here in the program. But others, uh, you can learn uh, jobs, because mm -hmm. people change jobs, right? uh, yeah. in your case, right? Mm -hmm. And so things that, well, I, well kind of maybe a uh, waste of uh, time, sort of, uh, the two years in, uh, in school here, you, you wish you could have uh, more flexibility. And, but kind of uh, your uh, thoughts, this moment, uh, uh, providing some feedback to uh, I was sort of telling Liz. Well, that I guess it's know. okay to be critical at this moment. <laughs> <laughs> no one could be any greater. Um, no, but I was sort of telling this. So I went to the planning program um, with the degree in graphic design, but not a lot of work experience. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. And so I just probably did like the survey course approach where I sort of took everything in um, and didn't know exactly what I was going to do with it. Um, and so I imagine that um, each of you have a different story and a different entry point into kind of what you're doing in planning school and like what you want to get out of it. For me, I didn't know at the time. Um, and so I, I think had I, now I, I think if I ha could do it again, I would do it, a I, I would know maybe what courses to hone in on. Um, but I guess when I, I think the AICP exam to plug APA is, is like a really in, a good way to, um, to think about the, the breadth of the profession and the different areas of focus. Um, and I think that, you know, the planning program here does a good job of aligning with that um, in terms of teaching to a, a variety of different um, areas that you can go into in your profession. Uh, I personally draw a lot on participatory methods. I draw a lot on, um, you know, kind of the history of planning, land use law. Like those classes for me have been um, ones where I've gotten the textbook out, you know, and applied them to my profession in my professional capacity. But um, but yeah, I I think it just depends on your, your kind of entry point and what you're looking to do. Um, personally, um, I didn't go to planning school, so I'm not. Sh I, I look. I briefly looked at the uh, CRP's um, sort of uh, curriculum, but uh, from my experience, um, I don't have a lot of policy background. Um, but from the workplace, uh, in working with a lot of physical planners, um, sort of having a, an eye for design and having some computer skills and uh, being able to um, read and understand um, sort of uh, uh, engineering drawings and, 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 and um, platting and, and all of this stuff. Being able to, being able to read that um, is really critical, um, especially if you want to go into the more real estate and development uh, side of planning um, because that is uh, sort of putting sort of pen to paper and um, eventually you'll see something either rise out of the ground. I mean, it, this even applies to um, uh, specifically, oh, we were talking earlier about uh, floodplains, and um, if, if you need to learn how to, or it's very helpful for planners and, and folks 
from the city or also private sector to understand the floodplains, the consequences of that, being able to read the maps, understand like, oh, so the 500-year uh, floodplain is now going to be the 100-year floodplain. What is the insur there's insurance consequences, there is um, engineering and, um, and sort of development um, consequences, setbacks, and all this stuff. So under if you're looking to get into more of the physical planning realm, just diving in and, or looking at those types of drawings and understanding, you know, turning radii that civil engineers use and stuff like that, because that'll really help you. And I think that in a two in a two year span, um, it's very difficult to gain, get that exposure. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. For